This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hi, and welcome to the very first episode of Screen Time Reset. I'm your host, Lauren Pear. For the uninitiated, screen time is the time we spend on smartphones, tablets, um, TVs, and computers. And most of us have noticed that the time we're spending on these devices has increased dramatically from the past decade or so when smartphones really became ubiquitous. But most of us kind of just fell into our habits with these devices. They do a lot of cool things and, and we just sort of adopted them without really foreseeing how central they become to our lives and some of the unintended consequences they have on our brains, our children, even our social and political fabric. But now, it, there's been some time, so research is coming out, we're able to see patterns emerge out of anecdotal accounts, and so the idea of this show is that armed with this information, it's time for us both individually and as a society to have a screen time reset, where we're resetting our relationships with screens so that um, we are consciously choosing our relationship and trying to harness the benefits while minimizing the harms. So that's the focus of the show. Our first mission is to educate on what screens are doing. And the second goal is to come up with solutions and really to facilitate those solutions when possible as well. Um, also, the focus is going to start on children and families. This is for two reasons. First, Children are more susceptible to the uh, seductive pull of technology. They don't have the prefrontal cortex development to exercise self-control. And second of all, they're also more um, sensitive to the effects of screens. So we're going to start there, which brings me, I'll transition now into the topic of this first episode, which is getting the perspective of teachers who have been uh, in the profession for quite some time on how they're seeing children change um, as a result of screens and the implications this has for both their academic and professional success. I think teachers really have a unique uh, perspective because they spend more time with kids than anyone else. And they also see new cohorts of kids year after year after year. So they have this longitudinal experience that is so valuable and I think is really key to, um, to, to learning about to understand what's happening with kids and screens. So with that, I am uh, delighted and honored to, in, uh, to introduce and welcome my first two guests, who are Joe Clement and Matt Miles. They are teachers in Virginia with over 30 years combined teaching experience. They are fathers, and they are also co-authors of a fantastic book, Screen Schooled, which I highly recommend. I, uh, it is just full of excellent research compelling anecdotes, and really incisive commentary on, on this topic. So if, if you're a parent who cares about this topic, you should probably own this book. And with that, thank you so much for joining us, Joe and Matt. Could you please tell us um, a little bit more about your background, maybe some important things that I didn't mention, and also how it is that you became so uh, passionate about this topic of screens and kids? Well, thanks, first of all, thanks very much for having us, and thanks for the very nice things you said about the book and, and the work that we've done. Um, we, as you mentioned, we've got between us over 30 years of teaching experience. I have more of that, more of that 30 years than, than Matt does, but we um, both noticed probably uh, six, eight years ago that things were getting, were changing in the classroom, and they were changing for the worse. And so we started to think of readings that might be happening, and we were just kind of talking informally about it. And then we started to read everything we get our hands on um, about why this was happening. And was anybody else noticing it? And we found that there were lots of people noticing it, not just teachers, but uh, brain researchers and, and family therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists. And the more we read, the more we realized that there was a common link, and that link was screen time, the overuse of screen time. And if you look at the subtitle of the book, it's about, it's about overuse. It's not, um, it's not about just all technology is bad, blah, blah, blah. We both come to this with the backgrounds in IT. Um, so we didn't come into this with an agenda saying we're going we're gonna to try and submarine the educational technology movement for anything. We came into it saying, why are kids going to have more trouble in the classroom? And this would be the, the answer that seemed the most common in, in all the studies that we read and the people we talked to, this was it. 
So we started to look at what was out there for uh, about schools, kids and schools and technology in the mix, and there was a lot out there about uh, how to use more technology in the classroom. But there really wasn't anything about about this, the science behind that or what's happening to a kid's brain. And so we decided, well, if there's nothing out there, we should write a book. So we wrote it, and, um, and thanks for having it there. We forgot to bring one, but uh, thanks very much for having it again. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you clarified that point because I think it's so important that you guys are uh, believers in tech, you're users of tech. And so I, I'd like to start off by asking you, you know, what you see the big benefits of tech being and what has to be in place for people and students to really take advantage of those benefits. Yeah, I mean, we're obviously in that thing. All tech is bad. There's a lot of productive sides to you know, technology. One of the things is Joe and I wrote a book, you know, using a lot of the research we got from the internet. Uh, we're having a Zoom meeting right now uh, on our laptops. Um, you know, there's a lot of great things you can do with technology, but it's our experience that when we walk around our classroom, we're not seeing kids doing productive things with their cell phones. We're not seeing kids doing productive things with their laptops. They're not you know, having Zoom meetings or they're not using Excel spreadsheets or coding or, well, you know, primarily what they're doing, the research backs this up, is they're playing games, they're watching movies, and they're watching movies with kids playing games. Um, there's, there's something spectacular about how they're using technology, and the average kid is using technologies for, or they're consuming over nine hours a day of wow. digital technology, almost entirely you know, it's all self-amusement um, and it's passive consumption. They're not creating, they're not, there's all kinds of, um, you know, not worthwhile things that they're doing. The problem is the productive side of technology is way less appealing to an analyst in mind than the entertaining side. So, so it becomes quite a challenge for a teacher to pull the kid from the entertainment and get them to realize the productive side. And I think that's what a lot of the book is about. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it makes teachers' jobs incredibly challenging, and it's a little unfair that teachers, it seems, are always sort of getting the holding the bag on this, that they have to be more engaging when it's just like you can't be as engaging as Netflix or you know whatever else. It's not a fair yeah. benchmark. Um, so from your broad experience, like I said, I love talking to veteran teachers because you have this longitudinal experience. How have you, in broad strokes, seen kids change over the past 10 or 15 years? Um, well, the, the main thing would be, well, there are a couple key areas. The, the social interaction uh, has really taken a hit. The, uh, their ability to focus, their ability to solve problems and think critically. Those are the four we, we typically talk about. Um, socially, they're just, um, they have trouble looking you in the eye. Um, and, it's, and it's beyond, you know, if somebody can't look you in the eye when they're talking to you, that's not the worst thing in the world. But we know that there's a whole bunch of research out there about for instance, uh, empathy and how uh, empathic kids are, and things like recognizing emotions and what is what is somebody else experiencing? This other person that I'm talking to, what are they experiencing? And uh, kids have gotten way worse over over years. And this again, this isn't just our observation. There's a lot of science behind it that they've gotten worse at recognizing things like facial expression, body language, and so on. The good news is that can be reversed. There are there are several. Um, like they, I mean, for lack of a better word, you call them rehab camps where they send kids for a week or 10 days or, or two weeks. And at the end of a week or two even, um, of being totally screen free, kids' empathy scores go way up and they start to recognize, oh, this means this person is in pain in some way. And uh, and that makes obviously the, the job of a teacher more difficult if kids aren't empathic and they're not able to interact socially and, and to do simple things like say, hey, we need to get together to work on this project. And if that becomes a a stumbling block, then you know we're, we're really in trouble. Um, they have more difficult time solving basic problems, following basic directions. They have more, more trouble focusing. If you're if you're um, believe what's out there in the literature, it's um, the average student is using three or four devices when they're trying to do homework: their phone, their laptop, their iPad, some sort of uh, music player. Um, and so they're. Their attention is, has always been split from one device to the next, and then you get in a classroom where you're supposed to sit for 45 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half. It's just very, very difficult, and that has been that's become clear to us over the last, like I said, six or eight years. 
Um, and then one of the first things we did was talk to other teachers, hey, are you seeing this? And, and almost everybody we talked to said, yeah, no, we, especially people who've been teaching for a while, so would agree. And that wasn't just in our building. We started to reach out to people in adjacent buildings and then around the country, eventually around the world. And it seems to be a pretty ubiquitous trend. Great, yeah. Um, you know, my, my background is in economics, and I also did some work in workforce development, and so I, I really think a lot about that, that angle of it as well, and what you're talking about, the interpersonal skills, the problem solving, also deep thinking. These are things that I've um, identified, I, I think I coined the term human competitive advantages, which are things that we humans do better than computers. So. It strikes me that in this age of AI um, increasing rapidly and automation, that to stay relevant in the job market, it's really important that kids hone these human competitive advantages since they will be competing with AI and, um, you know, and automation. And so you, know, you talked a bit there about their interpersonal skills, trouble making eye contact, trouble understanding what other people are thinking, which is pretty big. Can you tell us a little bit about problem solving, too? I think that sometimes that can sound kind of vague. Um, do you have concrete examples of, of how children's problem solving skills have declined? Um, I mean, we've got, yeah, we've got, we've got plenty. Um, yeah, and some of these are going to seem, um, and you, know, you can look and say, well, that's just one kid in one situation. And, and if it was just one kid in one situation, that would be one thing. These are, we see things like this all the time, so the example is increasing. Yeah, we see the, the rate of an increase in the, the prevalence of issues mm -hmm. like this. Right, and so the, the one that leaps to my mind is that I, I, in, I teach economics, and, and one of the uh, simulations we do is productivity simulation. Essentially, they're different sized teams, and they have to cut out shapes, and the team that has the highest productivity, which is the output divided by the number of workers, wins. And so the game is usually won by the team with the uh, the fewest kids, because everybody has two pairs of scissors. If you have 10 people on your team, we have two people on your team. So it's not really a fair game to start with, which is kind of the point of the exercise. Um, but, but two years ago, I was doing this, and every single time I've ever done this activity, the team of two has won it. And uh, I noticed the team of two in this particular case where they were just sitting there. And I walked over and I said, well, what's, what's going on? And they said, well, um, we're we're trying to we're trying to fold the paper and cut and stuff, but these are right-handed scissors, and I'm left-handed. Uh, one of the kids said, and I kind of stared at them and I said, "Well, are, are you left-handed?" To the other kid, and she said, "No," and I said, "Okay." And I, I helped them arrive with the idea that maybe they should change jobs, and so they, oh, oh. And they had they had actually Googled how do you win a, a uh, how do you win a productivity simulation, and they didn't see an answer that translated to what they were trying to do, so they just gave up and they were sitting there flipping through their phone. Um, and so that was the first time ever that a, a team of two had lost that that game. And and afterward, I was really disturbed by the fact that it, it seemed like a pretty obvious thing. I think to most people that oh maybe the person who's right-handed should use the right-handed scissors, and the other person should be folding and tracing or whatever. Um, and again, that's an isolated example, of course. It doesn't mean that, well, okay, they obviously lost problem solving ability because of their cell phones. But there are things like that. I mean, we had, this, we had a, you know, a three hour show, we could tell you, you know, three hours worth of those. I would just add to that, too. You, you mentioned earlier the, the benefits of the technology, but, but technology is used to exploit underlying skills. And when we see a lack of problem solving, critical thinking, creative thinking, um, things like research has become really hard for kids to do. Like, like Google is so intuitive, you don't need to be teaching kids how to use Google. They know how to type and click in a bar. What to search is where they really struggle. They don't know what to search. And I, say, I tell a story in the book about a kid who, who couldn't find any primary sources. He comes up to me, there's no primary sources on my topic. And I said, well, what's your topic? And he said, the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's just this idea of, of, you know, so many kids are coming up saying, well, I don't know what to search, and you have to kind of hate walk their hands. But, but technology is really great if you have underlying personal skills. Social media can, can amplify those. If you have creative thinking and problem-solving skills, research and, and research databases are wonderful for that. But, but when kids grow up with this technological aid, they don't develop 
these underlying skills, and then there's nothing to be amplified. I mean, think about social media, for example. They don't have, a lot of kids grow up using social media as their only method of communicating, and the quality of communication you see on social media is far inferior to when you see face-to-face. -face. Definitely. Um, and with that, we're going to take a break and then just come right back and, and start up again. So we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. And we're back. So I wanted to, uh, you know, the, uh, Matt and Joe were just telling us about how problem-solving skills have deteriorated. And I was curious if you guys could ask, uh, tell us more about how children's thinking has changed and um, deep thinking in particular. Actually, I wanted to start by reading uh, the first paragraph in the third chapter of your book, which is reclaiming your child's ability to think and then um, let you expand on it and, and maybe give us a, a concrete example. Um, one of the hottest topics in education right now, besides how to incorporate more technology into classrooms, is how to improve students' critical thinking. Over the last decade, teachers across the country have bemoaned a marked decline in their students' ability to think for themselves. Formal stable activities such as creative writing prompts, formulating opinions, developing arguments, or answering open-ended questions are becoming increasingly challenging for students. Many teachers have simply abandoned them because their efforts to generate deeper levels of thought seem futile. Everyone is trying to figure out ways to improve critical thinking in students, but no one seems to be trying to figure out why these skills were lost in the first place. I thought that was alarming. I mean, as someone who, who isn't from education, I didn't realize that, that teachers were having so much trouble with these um, staples, as, as you put it. So um, could you tell us a little bit more about that and, and maybe give us an example to illustrate? Sure. The, um... I, I think there's a couple things going on. One of the, uh, and this is not necessarily technology related, but the, the standards based movement where there was a, there was a period of, of 10 or so years, at least in, in our state, where um, there, there was a tremendous value placed on uh, fact recall. Just, I know this date, this thing happened, and you know, put the bubble in the right bubble, and you get the, you get the prize or whatever. You get the, you know, you get the coin in the test. Um, but you combine that with the environment in which a student's brain is operating today, which is the, the, the Google environment, and, and all period long, students are allowed to have their cell phones or their laptops. They, they're looking things up, and so they will tell you, students will tell you, that they're thinking all the time, they're not even know things, and whatever. Um, and that's not really thought. That, that's, that's just looking things up. And so they will... Um, go, we are outsourcing our ability to to think critically about something, and we're we're replacing that with just okay. Well, Google will tell me what date this thing is, or what whatever. That you, you can look anything up, and when you can't look at it, if it's your opinion about something, or it's what was the effect of this thing on this other thing, or there's some there's some bigger issue other than just knowing a piece of, of information. Uh, students really struggle, and one of the one of the scary parts is that you know it used to be that it was it was easy when it, you know you would see in a, in a prompt what is your opinion of blah 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 and you go okay good I don't have to know anything for this one and you could just you know write your answer and and really you were displaying your knowledge because you would say this is my opinion and this is why I think that and so on uh, now it's very difficult to get that out uh, of students what's your opinion on the 14th Amendment, uh, equal protection of the, of the laws, and 
you'll get an answer like that's in section one of the 14th amendment okay yes it is but what does that mean and why does it apply to you and how does it apply to to your your life and school life um it, that to me has been the the, the scary part about the decline in, in deep thought yeah the the whys are, are what kids really show why is why? this and can you explain this and that's where you know they kind of think like google you know, and, and, and this is a, we were talking to a group of middle schoolers a couple of weeks ago, and we asked them, what is the produ- what are some productive things you do with uh, your technology? And the kid, the kid Rick, rose his hand, he said, uh, I have this app on my phone, and I'll take a picture of the math equation, and it instantly gives me the answer. And he, so that's, to him, that was the most productive use of his, and, you know, the teachers were going to point out that that was cheating, and, and he was baffled by that. He's like, it gives me the right answer instantly. And what Joe just said, too, is, is that it kind of illustrates the evolution of that idea is we are outsourcing a lot of our cognitive function to our devices. Um, you know, one of these ProTech articles we read, you know, even he, the, the writer, opened with a quote from a girl who said, when I lose my phone, I lose half my brain. And I, I totally agree. Uh, when you depend on you're going to generate right answers, your brain isn't doing that. And as teachers, our goal isn't, we don't have a quota of correct answers we need to hit by the end of the day. We want to see that you can do it, your brain can do it, you can generate a right answer on your own. Right. And unfortunately, kids aren't giving themselves that chance. I equate the phone to, you know, teachers can relate to the story. You know, they always one kid in the next to answer a question, they just raise their hand immediately and shout out the answer before any other kid has a chance to think about it. And that's detrimental because some kids need that minute to think and recall. Um, now we have our phones doing it for us. The phone is the kid that ruins the, every question. You know, it, they, it answers it for you before you even can recall. And that recall is so important to internalizing knowledge and recalling information in the future. Yeah, and, and that's bringing up, or kind of going back to what Matt said earlier, um, Earlier generations, the people our age and older, had uh, developed these skills, and so the, the phone or the laptop or whatever can enhance those. And some of us are certainly guilty of outsourcing our, you know, our, our ability to think. But uh, if you're 14 or, or 10 or, or even 16 or 18, you've really not known much of life without uh, a device to do those things for you. So if you never developed those, the, the ability to to think deeply and critically, uh, to solve problems and so on. Uh, I don't know how we're expecting kids to be able to do that. And the temptation for them is always, well, my phone will know. And that's really, we have to dial that back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that makes a lot of sense. It's really interesting. And um, it, it's interesting, too, because there's a, a chapter in your book that I, I really love the title of the chapter, which was, you know, the myth of the technologically in, enhanced super kid. And it, it seemed like there was this big push uh, to convince society and also within schools that, um, you know, technology was going to make this new generation of smarter, better critical thinking, more knowledgeable students. And it's so interesting to see what you're reporting because it seems like the absolute opposite. It wasn't just false. It was like the opposite of what happened. So I, how did that myth become so pervasive and, and what was the research to, to back it up? Well, big tech companies paid a lot of money for research, but, but any, any, anytime you hear about, you know, the technology or the technically enhanced super kid, you're, you're hearing about the focus on what can be done with technology. And it's this absolute focus on all the positives. And it'll even sometimes you'll see people spin um, like how kids are learning from video games, problem solving, thumb dexterity we hear a lot about. Um, so, but, but they, but that's not how kids are actually using it. So, so if you thought of a kid who's only using their spare time to research and write and compose and, you know, do digital photography and that's how they spent the eight hours, nine hours a day on technology, yeah, they may be better off than ever before, but that's not reality at all. And there's such a a disconnect between what we see as kids and what parents see kids using technology to do and what we're told kids are being doing by companies who happen to be selling that same technology. 
Um, you know, most parents or most people, teachers, people who interact with kids on a daily, they just wouldn't look at a kid on the phone and be like, I'm glad you know, you're doing such wonderful things on that. But you turn on an ad or something like that, that's what you're inundated with. And the research and we're being inundated as teachers is all, again, Focus on what they can do with it, and it's not at all based in what they are doing with it. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a chapter in the book also called the uh, Education Industrial Complex, and, and part of your question was how did it get that way? And, and Matt mentioned this, but the uh, if, if you're a if you're a uh, principal or a superintendent and your school district is is struggling, um, and you know schools all over the world are are constantly being called on to do more. Uh, and it should be, and, and held accountable for making sure the kids um, are, are reaching their potential. If you're a superintendent or a principal and you're worried about the way your school system's doing, and somebody comes to you and says, hey, we've got the answer. You know, we've got, and, and they, they you know, take you to lunch or whatever, and they, they tell you, they give you a slick presentation, and they, um, they show you all these cool tools and things that, like I said, can be done, you're going to buy in. So, and, and the issue is, you know, if you're in a, a big school system, you know, you might make, if you're a salesman for Dell or, or Apple or whatever, you might make uh, 50 or 80 or 100,000 sales in, in one conversation, you know. So that's, there's a lot of bang for the buck for the ed tech industry to focus on schools, um, particularly big school districts. Yeah, yeah, that's um, kind of alarming, but that's the reality. And it's important to realize that. Um, so we are running short on time, and unfortunately, I, I wanted to delve more into uh, sort of the complaints about employers these days with the newest batch of, of students that are graduating, and there are some really fantastic examples in this book on that. I can know, having worked last year for a state senator, that uh, the business leaders in our district were certainly complaining about interpersonal skills, the motivation to show up on time. And, uh, and a lot of the things that are hit on in this book that are, that are so important. And again, there's a, a great discussion in here on it. Um, to wrap up, you know, uh, I, I like to be solutions focused. I mean, what are your takeaways and, and what do you see as a solution to this uh, issue? Yeah, I think, I think the first thing is you have to have a reasonable expectation of what kids can do. Um, with technology, a, a child's still a child, and, and you can't just hand a kid something that is a toy for eight or nine hours a day and then expect them to realize the full potential. We have to have reasonable expectations. If you want a kid to use more productive, less entertaining sides of technology, you have to have parental or teacher oversight over that. You have to keep them on task, and you have to pull them out of that entertainment and have reasonable expectations for kids. The great thing about kids and they're always just going to be kids. So that's, I think, the first and the foremost. Um, uh, the second thing we suggest is that uh, parents have to ask um, themselves and, and their teachers and their, and their schools, how is this thing, this device or this app or this way of doing things, better than the non-digital version, the non-screen-based version, the analog version, for, for lack of a better word? Like, um, if you're talking about online textbooks, a lot of school districts now are going to online textbooks. That's a cost saving, I guess. But is it better for kids? Is that, is it, is that really what's better for kids? Well, there's a tremendous amount of research showing that people, not just kids, people learn better from paper textbooks, uh, not digital textbooks. So we have to have a reason that we're using a digital tool. We have no problem at all with using digital tools or any kind of tools when it makes sense, when it's better, when it's the best available option for a kid. An example I would give is that I had a, an astronomy class in college, and the, the inside front cover had a star map, and the book was printed in Iowa, but I went to school in Virginia, and so the star map was good some of the time for part of the map if you were in Iowa. Um, but that's not very helpful. That's a, a paper version of a, of, a, of a star map. But if you put Google Sky on your phone for free, you can point it at the sky during the day, and it'll tell you what's in the sky. Or point it at the ground, it'll tell you what's on the other side of the earth, and so on. So that's really useful. That's a way better use of that's a, that is far superior than a paper star map. So this, so that's the, the second thing we would we would urge all parents and teachers to ask is why is this thing better that we're doing with this digital tool? How's it better than the, the non-digital? 
And, and the last thing is, is, don't be afraid to speak up. If, if you're a parent, that school criticisms are surprisingly receptive to parents, especially over teachers and students yeah. who they're used to complaining about things. Uh, parents can impact change. Um, you know, if you're unhappy with your child being forced to spend their evenings on a laptop because you know six of their eight teachers require online homework, speak up. You know, mention. Things try to say, you know, this is what is there an alternative to this? Because I'm trying to set screen limits for my child, and this is making it very difficult. So, so speak up, you know, be the instrument of change, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just to echo on that parents have a, have a key role in all this. Yeah, I, I'm completely with you guys um, there, and I think that's such an important point. And that leads me to make a, a quick announcement that I want to make that next month I'm going to be starting a, a group or a network of parents who, you know, if you're watching this episode, you agree this is an issue and you want to elevate this issue in your school, shoot me an email at screentimereset at gmail.com. Next month, I'm going to try, it'll probably be a Facebook group, connecting parents so that they uh, really have that support. Because a lot of the parents I talk to who care about this issue, they feel very alone. They're not connected or aware of the other parents at their school that care about this issue. And, um, you know, even if it's via Facebook and it's not all from the same school, just having that support, people to learn from, people to get encouragement from, um, I, I think that the passionate parents are out there and we need to connect them. So I said this, this show is solutions focused and that's a way that I hope to help facilitate that. And with that, I want to thank uh, Matt and Joe so much for being with us again. Uh, I also mm -hmm. want to say one more time, fantastic book. Um, I read it myself. It's completely marked up. So good. Please get it. And um, I also want to thank the great people at ThinkTech for making this all possible. And to you, the viewer, I know that you're busy, especially if you're a parent, and that you take the time to tune in and learn about this important topic. Um, I really commend you and honor you for that, especially since it can sometimes be uncomfortable. And I'm sure there's a, you know, uh, plenty of, of other amusing content vying for your attention. So thank you so much, and until next time. <laughs>